Hi, TV. Hi, Amrit. So nice to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, your your presence and your time to to share with us uh, uh, on this really important topic, especially as this is a, a time where people are still um, you know in lockdown and still um, wanting to figure out how to do things better for their startups. Um, I'd like to just first uh, have the audience know a little bit about you, uh, Tuve, and then a little bit more about your company. Do yeah. You like to share? Yes, I would love to. Uh, so my name is Tove Dahlgren and I work as head of education at the Albright Foundation. And for those of you, it might be many here today who've never heard about Albright before. What we do is we are a small nonprofit foundation uh, that work towards increasing the gender equality and the diversity especially in the Swedish business sector. And, and we usually explain what we do by saying that our, our prioritized goal is to work against meritocracy. Basically meaning that we believe that all recruitment and promotion decisions should be based solely on merits and nothing else like, for example, who the CEO likes to play golf with or knows from high school or, or who the CEO thinks reminds them most about themselves. Uh, and and we, we work towards this goal mainly in two different ways. Uh, we educate, which is what I do the most, helping those business leaders who, who are brave enough to, to tackle these issues and, and smart enough to see the business potential of working with diversity in how they can become more inclusive. And secondly, we work with forming public opinion, uh, making sure that these issues are always on top of the agenda, mainly by every year releasing two different reports. So is, um, is there a, um, a way that you do this is actually just through reports and surveys and you collectively would then push out data? So I understand that you have a lot of data that would actually support your findings and uh, be able to then make conclusions and uh, smart uh, uh, advice to, to different leaders. I'd like to just specifically ask you about the recent tech report that you made and what were the things that you had uh, found in that report that would actually help with um, identifying some of the issues or the things that can be improved to make the formula of a successful team? Yes, uh, so, so um, well, we, every year we release two different reports, right? So in one of these reports, we've been doing these for the last nine years, and in one of these reports, we map out the gender equality of all listed companies on the Stockholm Stock Exchange. Uh, so that is about 333 companies last year. Uh, so we map out the gender equality and we rank them from best to worst when it comes to gender equality. And we have all of these data for the last nine years. Uh, but then also, besides that report, we every year release a report where we take a look at a new industry every year. So for example, we've been looking into the Swedish private equity firms, the law firms, the universities, and now the latest one then, the Swedish tech industry. Uh, so it was just a couple of weeks ago actually, where we, when we released a report called Tech Dudes Caught in Their Own Myth. Um, and, and the reason for us wanting to look deeper into the tech industry is, of course, uh, because during these last nine years, a lot of people has, has contacted us in different ways, telling us to, to take a deeper look into the sector, uh, uh, pinpointing some specific problems. So what we, and also, of course, because of the, the immense power that lays with, within the tech industry, of course, of, in shaping and forming our societies. Uh, so what we did was we, we um, we wanted to take a deeper look into this huge Swedish tech sector and to be able to do that we had to narrow down of course so we took a look at 14 of Sweden's most influential talked about or up-and-coming tech companies uh, and then we collected a, a bunch of data uh, regarding for example gender equality of management positions we also did a great deal of interviews with people in within the swedish tech industry in different positions in different companies and we also sent out a survey to to all of these 14 listed companies to their employees and then we gathered all of this data and statistics and quotes and and whatever in the reports which can be found on our website uh, but but maybe you want to hear some of the most interesting findings right Absolutely, I can't yes. wait to hear this <laughs> yes. because um, I think that you know it's so easy to get reports and then not know how to interpret them, and uh, your expertise would actually help to sift the 
the key points that we'd like to raise and have provoke uh, an, uh, an understanding and thought. Yes, uh, of course, that is, that is what we want to do, uh, provoke thoughts. Uh, well, well, so basically what we could see was that out of these 14 companies, uh, we had two who had a gender equal management team. So two out of 14 companies. Mm. And both of these companies reach the bare minimum of what we call gender equality, where no gender is represented to more than 60 or less than 40 percent. Uh, so not, not a single company reached 50-50 and not a single company reached a majority of women in the management teams. And I think that this is striking because this means that the, that the total number of female managers in these companies is 29 percent. Mm, so 29 wow. percent, meaning that over 70 percent of all managers are still men. And I think that this is extra interesting because, because I think that in, within the Swedish tech industry or the global tech industry, I would say, there is a very well established self image, right, of being these forward thinking groundbreakers, the using these big words about the necessity of being diverse and, and being able to attract talents from all over the world. And right. even so, when you actually look at the numbers, we have 29% female managers. We also have one female CEO out of 14 and we have one female founder out of 57. Uh, so that's some of the most interesting statistics, I would say, like the hard, the hard data from these companies. So when, when you say that it's 29%, was it, would it be because there hasn't been enough um, women in the field or wh is there a deeper layer that we can actually investigate as to correlate why that is so? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And, and I think that is um, a great deal of what we do at Albright too. We always look at what the representations say, the hard statistics and the data, right? Uh, but we also, of course, want to look into what does these numbers mean? What does the representation actually tell us? Why is this a problem? Um, because we always go get those excuses to the ones saying that, well, there simply aren't any women or women are not interested in tech, for example, or women do not want to lead or become managers. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we, what we also did was, as I was saying, we did the survey uh, with the employees and we did these interviews uh, just really to back these data up. And, and one interesting finding there uh, is at the survey when we ask the question whether or not the respondent feel that it is harder for them to have a career in tech, depending on, for example, their background or identity, we could see that 67, 67% of, out of the respondents who identify as being women of color answered yes, that it's harder for them, compared to the number of white men saying the same thing, which was 4%. So I would say that there's, wow. there's definitely a problem uh, when it comes to the culture of the tech industry. And we could also see this in, in for example, the responses uh, to the questions whether or not people had been subjected to discriminatory behavior or sexual harassments, where every third female respondent say that she has been discriminated against and more than every fifth female say that she has experienced sexual harassments. So, wow. yes. So I would say that even though there might not be 50, 50% female men walking into the tech industry, uh, you could most definitely also see that the Swedish tech industry has a huge problem of, of, um, of creating this diverse and inclusive workplaces and teams where people actually want to stay. Uh, so there might be a problem getting 50-50 even in an entry level, but we can see that, that most companies are much, much better when it comes to having gender equality and diversity at an entry level, but then losing out on talent uh, on the way to the top. So what then would be, I mean, in terms of uh, gender equality, I mean, all the, the rhetoric is actually, of course, about uh, the equal workplace, but how does it play out in its success in, the, in, a, in a company? You, you mean a company that actually reaches gender equality or? Sure, what? yes, yes, compared yeah. to one that doesn't. Yeah, uh, so, so um, another part of what we do, of course, is to keep up with research. Uh, and there's actually quite, quite, um, quite a heavy research body by, uh, right now. And there's actually more studies being conducted every year that, that shows us a correlation between an increase in, for example, gender equality or diversity and an increase in revenue. Uh, so basically showing us that, that having diverse teams are actually smarter, makes us smarter uh, as a business. 
And what the research say when digging into why this is the fact, why can we see these numbers? Uh, it is, I would say, first and foremost, three specific areas that is being pinpointed. And it's first and foremost, of course, the attraction and retention of, of the best possible talents. Uh, really to just be able to see as a manager that if you want to create the best possible team, if you want to attract the best possible talents out there, then you also need to understand the talents come in all different sizes, shapes and forms. Correct. And you need to create an environment where everyone can thrive and, and perform at their full potential. The second is, of course, uh, uh, that in these diverse teams, we also become more innovative. We basically become smarter. Uh, the more people we have with different mindsets, experiences, backgrounds, or, or different, different expertise to bring to the table, uh, the better the decisions we make will actually be. And third, of course, uh, to be able to attract um, 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 people buying our services or, 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 um, or products, really. Uh, so making sure that we, we attract an as big customer base as possible. And to be able to do that, we also need to make sure that as many people as possible in society can identify with us and the products and, and, and services that we offer. And How would you go about to make that kind of balance? I mean, if you're talking to someone who's at a leadership role to do this and they're, um, they're not aware of this, how would you actually in the practical steps help them to give them a top tip of what they need to do, checklists and things like that to be able to become more diverse or more equal on, uh, in gender? In, in, is there any other, uh, is there age also is an, in, an issue? Is it just the gender and the color or is it age? Uh, most definitely, I think age is an, is an issue too, uh, maybe more so in tech than in any other industry, because I think once again, tech has a, has a self-image of, of being very young and modern and forward thinking, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and right. being a senior person or an elderly person, you don't really maybe seem to fit into that model of, of a tech worker or a tech nerd or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so I think it's definitely an issue that runs, um, runs over a bunch of topics uh, or grounds for discrimination, whether it being ethnicity, religion, gender, sexuality or age. Uh, but I would say that there's a lot of concrete advices on how you can move forward. But I think the most important one prob probably where you need to start as a manager is to become aware about what kind of biases you carry with you. So you need to become aware of, of how your prior experiences and your knowledge about people and the world you meet, how, they, how that knowledge affects the decisions that you make. And to explain that to people, I, I usually talk about uh, the research theory of homosociality, which is a hard word, but just basically means that we as humans really have a tendency of, of course, identifying with people who reminds us much about ourselves. So whenever we sit across someone who, who uh, looks very similar to us or who has the same hobbies as us, for example, or maybe went to the same university or laughs at the same jokes, for example, we do have a tendency of feeling this immediate uh, trust for that person. Um, and that will and that can happen to us making decisions not really based on merits, as I was talking about before, but instead making decisions based on that gut feeling, you know. I have a nice gut feeling for this person. Um, so, so first and foremost, I think just revealing to yourself that you are probably biased as well, because we all are. I am biased as well, and you are biased as well, Amrit. We all are, because we have these experiences in a backpack with us from, from what we experienced early on in our lives. Uh, so first and foremost, to become aware of that problem and then start working with issues. So I have a question. I mean, we all have our biases, but then, of course, I can't see my blind spots. OK, so even if I do these, um, you know, these uh, kind of um, uh, self-awareness tests or improvement tests, or Myers-Briggs or whatever it may be, I can't seem to identify those unconscious biases. How would I be able to identify those blind spots to be able to make my team successful? What can I do to seek out uh, help? Where would I go? Well, I think there's a lot of, of um, companies who, who works with, for, um, uh, for example, holding unconscious biases trainings uh, today. There's also a lot of unconscious biases training being 
available online. I think both Facebook and Google has them, for example. Uh, so there is knowledge to be found out there. You just need to go searching for it. Uh, when I try to, to attack the problem, I try to do it by pinpointing to what the research actually say, uh, just to try to really uh, debunk these myths, maybe, that people have saying that, well, I I don't see color or I don't see gender, for example. This is not an issue uh, when it comes to me. I always judge a person by the character or merits, for example, uh, because I think that could, prob that could probably help you a lot. For example, pointing in Sweden to numbers saying that, well, uh, if you have an um, Arabic or African sounding name, for example, studies show us that you have to send out 50% more CVs just to get to the same amount of interviews as a person with a typical Swedish sounding name. So, so we are definitely biased. Um, and also um, a very interesting study uh, that comes from a Norwegian marketing school that I often use as, as an example. Uh, it's called a study about Hans and Hanna, which is a typical male sounding versus female sounding Norwegian name. And in, in this study, what they did was they had a bunch of students in a class, right? And they asked them to all read a case study about a really tough, morally corrupted, more or less, uh, tech entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Um, and when the students had read this case, they got to answer a bunch of questions regarding whether or not they think that this person is a good leader or if they want the, this person as a mentor, but also if they like this person, of course. And all students read the exact same case, the only difference being that half of the group read about Hans then, the male sounding name, and half of the group about Hanna. And the results were clear. Simply that more students liked Hans, more students wanted to go grab a beer with Hans after work, but maybe mm. more importantly, more students thought that Hans was a good, good leader and a good manager. And also that more students thought that Hanna was bossy than they thought about Hans. And uh, yeah. so that are just some examples of how you can, I think, which, which I think is very important to just make it clear to people that unconscious biases do exist. That is the very foundation that we need to start at and uh, becoming aware of the fact that we all probably have these ideas. And then, as I was saying, moving on to how can we actually, um, how can we work against them in, for example, recruitment and promotion processes. Then speaking of recruitment, how would you then go about asking, um, would it be a different strategy that they need to do in order to try and bring out that balance? What would you recommend for them when they're doing recruits? Well, when we talk about recruitments, there is so much to be done, I think, really. But first and foremost, which is a problem, I think, that is very uh, clear in tech industry. Uh, a lot of tech managers that I've been talking to or, or working with uh, say that when they started out just being a group of friends, right, in a startup, uh, writing code together, and then all of a sudden they started grow growing, they, they took in capital, and all of a sudden they, they need to, to recruit in a really, really, really fast pace. So what happened? they started looking into their friends. And when they were running out of friends, they asked their friends about their friends. And then they asked their already employees, of course, to, to tip them about other people who they could hire. And then a couple of years later, they call me and say that, hey, we, this is our very, very homogenous work group. And, and we have a problem, for example, with innovation or culture. Uh, so what I would say first and foremost is that you have to treat the recruitment processes professionally. You need to stop recruiting your friends or people from your tight buddy network or from the golf course or university. So you need to have time for recruitments. If you have the capital or the resources to take in help, I would also mm -hmm. advise you to take help from recruitment firms. And when you do that, to have demands on these recruitment firms, say that we do not accept anything else than a candidate list of 50% men or 50% women, for example. And if you don't have the resources, then you need to work with yourself. You need to look over what kind of language we use in our ads. Please, for example, have different people writing your ads and also looking into your ads, not only you yourself. And you need to make sure that you, that you wonder about where do I post my ads to begin with? What kind of people actually see your ads and is applying for our jobs? And when it comes to having interviews, then a very easy tip is to make sure that you are always at least two people in the room, one man and one woman, because we do have a tendency of seeing different things. That's just some tips. But also, of course, anonymizing recruitment processes, taking away names from CVs, taking away age, for example, from CVs, pictures as well. 
there's a lot of very innovative ways to work with with um, un bias to recruitment processes. I would say there's something called a um, a uh, there is a confirmation bias, not an, uh, just only a conscious bias and an unconscious bias. The confirmation biases are also something that I think the yes managers would want endorsements on. But what is your take on the non or non confirm comfort or confrontational i would say you know people who are actually going to challenge the status quo is it a, is a dent to the ego for the leader and is it a good thing in a team because sometimes people like to uh, have less resistance and yeah, they agree. say they're not a team player and so what would you say to that kind of behavior if someone was a a spanner in the works and would say no to certain ideas in the team. Yeah, and I, uh, I recognize that that idea much, of course, and, and this is where you really need to challenge managers because I think that all managers can probably agree that um, it is much, much more challenging having a group of people who are not like-minded, who think in different ways, right? And I think probably that everyone out there who has ever been on a very homogenous team where people are very similar to yourself can also agree with this fact. We all know how comfortable these situations are, how, how nice it is to be confirmed in your ideas, who, how nice it is to never be challenged really. And of course, how, how like easy the decision-making processes are. Uh, what I would like to say here is basically that all business managers need to really, really think about whether or not it is in these teams that we come up with the best possible solutions and ideas. Because the research do show us that that, that is not the case. And I think for the tech industry as well, I think we have a bunch of examples where, where this confirmation biases or homogenous development teams has really become a problem from face recognition services not being able to tell the difference between non-white faces to to voice services like Siri and Alexa who who responds in a flirty manner to sexual harassment for example just two examples about how how not um, having this friction in the team and not having these different sets of voices and opinions uh, make you really blind or, or as you were saying uh, leads to this confirmation bias where everyone just really hypes each other's ideas uh, and as I was saying it's pro it, it, it probably goes very fast which I know is is an interest of the tech sector that is very rapidly growing uh, however sometimes I think you have a lot to win by just slowing down the pace a bit and do you think though that um, uh, leaders when they are um, to make decisions and to look at the global arena, also have to add uh, the dimension of culture as being something that's very important for their success and why? Yes, I, I most definitely do. And I, I always say that to managers as well, to remember that what kind of world we live in today and that uh, the person who was probably the right person for the job 10 years ago might not be the same person today, which is also a reason for why you need to, to update your candidate profile, right? You cannot just keep on recruiting the same uh, Hans as you did 10 years ago, uh, because the world is changing and we are in, in um, ever more contact with each other, uh, regardless of, of uh, cultural differences or, or um, language barriers or whatever it can be. And I think, think that is also an, an issue of how we really, as a society, define what competence is because i think often we are also very stuck in this idea about what a competent leader is and should be and that idea i think is often very closely connected to a typical male idea uh, when we think about a ceo or a, or a manager or if we just google ceo or manager a very clear picture will come up uh, about a white middle-aged man in a suit mm -hmm. so i think that that is something, also something that you really need to, to think about uh, when trying to compile your best possible team and, and recruiting and promoting managers. Uh, this idea that I immediately get in my head about what a manager should be, is that really what my team or my company needs in a leader today? And there I think that, that um, something that really should be viewed as a competence today is just what you're talking about. Understandings or experience, for example, from other cultures or just language skills really or whatever it can be that can really be of help in in this modern day society 
Yeah, and I think that sometimes it can be quite an expensive one. So, um, for example, there are certain animals that are a taboo in certain markets. And I remember uh, that uh, there were some cartoon characters and the, they couldn't, even with all that they've actually done in terms of efforts to cause to to uh, create a distribution to that demographic they didn't think about the cartoon and that it had a pig yeah and that's a, quite an offensive one and it's a big market so it can be a very expensive mistake to have if you didn't have the cultural insights and i and i cited one to you about you know the color red just a simple color no language in there Mm -hmm. But it's just that red in the West is means danger. But where we are in Hong Kong, red is luck. Yeah, super yeah. interesting example. Yeah. yeah. And so that's that really, really great. I mean, uh, I think that this is really important to, to um, take into note. And I think that uh, you've got a, um, a report out with uh, the six pillars uh, and attributes and how to uh, the key points of your findings that have been elaborated that leaders could and should read and that could be accessed from your website is that right yes www.albright.se yeah great or our okay. facebook page or wherever really <laughs> are there any um uh, ego denting or ego lifting or um ego uh ignorant remarks that you want to give to leaders to say uh, formulas of success that, uh, you know, is just to look at a different perspective. Do you have some key things that you want to give away to some of these leaders today that would be um, something for them to be thought provoked for yeah. success in teams? Yeah, I have a lot of tips. <laughs> I, I'm not going to give them all to Five. you, and you'll find them in the report as well. But, but I, as I was saying, I think that one really, really important topic and where to start for everyone is really to put your ego aside for a second and to understand that we are all biased and to really start digging into what does that mean to me and how does that affect the sort of decisions I make in my company today my recruitment processes, for example, who I choose to promote, but also, of course, how do we, who in our team gets to go on management trainings, for example, or who do I bring for lunch? It can be as easy as that, really. Uh, to start looking into uh, how are you networking, since I know that you do a lot of that here in Startup Grind as well. What kind of people am I actually connecting with? and how come. And if you do that, if you ransack yourself and, you, and your network and you find out that, well, most people here are very, very similar to me, uh, then you should probably start thinking about how you can work actively to find other people to add to your network as well. Great. And then I would say that spinning on that, uh, whenever you get a chance to be invited somewhere to, whether it be a board of director or work task force or um, panel discussion, and you see that most people in this group are very similar to you once again, that you might probably bring the same voices and ideas to the table, then you can really, really have an effect on the diversity by simply saying no thank you and explaining why, and then tipping them about someone else in your network that, that in some way differs from this group norm. I have another one that I think is also a, a friction bearing um, uh, um, dilemma is that, you know, employees always want to get promoted. And in the current scenarios and environments, it's not it's not something that they, um, it's cultural. It, you can't go up and say to somebody, I don't know something, or I, uh, you know, such and such person is stalling my work, or it almost feels like you're telling them off. How would you, um, and of course, risking whether they get their promotion or not. And as in this precarious sort of environment, everybody is really trying to keep their jobs, of, of, of course. But um, at the same time, um, to have, to have to risk or to have to be heard, uh, especially if they're not in the high ranks. How would you um, guide that kind of dialogue? Yeah, and I think that is a 
tough one too uh, and that happens to us a lot of course people contacting us uh, explaining their differences or their problems with their manager for example so when we did this report for example we also went out to the public and said that if you think that we should should send this report to your specific manager or your management team then then give us a shout out uh, in, in our emails and we will do that anonymously which was very interesting we got a lot of emails and we send a lot of reports too uh, but I would one of my tips would really be to one tip for all like women or, or people who belongs to a minority group of some sort out there would be to to actively choose a company a manager and a CEO who has knowledge about these issues and who wants to work actively with them to start off with i think you should not spend your talents and all of your your best years working for someone who will not see your talent anyway or who is reluctant to to give you the help or the push you need uh, so i would basically say that one way of using your power as an, an employee is to to try of course to talk about these issues and to raise them with management but if you you're not being heard in any way then leave the company Oh, okay. uh, I know that it's not simple for everyone, but I think that's something that we all need to do. And this is also what I tell, what we tell students really, and that we have a lot of contact with as well, to remember to actively cho choose, to, to ask these questions when you're on the interview really. And if you're applying for a job at a Swedish company, then please bring the Albright report and say that how come you are so far down in the ranking here? What is the problem and how is it being handled? Wow. Uh, so to try when you can to talk about these issues and, and to make a point, but, but also to not put it on yourself to change the situation, but to change job, really. Okay, then, and also then to give students takeaways. I mean, I'm looking at women since we've actually got this Women in Tech uh, month, but what would you say to three different categories of women that are actually wanting to get into the tech field? So it would be the first would be for student graduates and what would it be that you would save for them uh, in terms of being able to uh, muscle into the tech uh, tech world? Um, the second uh, phase of women would be those who are pivoting and wanting to get into the tech world. And the third would be women that are already in the tech field but want to uprank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know uh, to what extent the advices would, would differ. Um, I think what I was just saying to you, I think that applies to probably everyone, um, um, like having demands on your employer um, mm -hmm. on working with these issues and, and trying to, to map out those issues when it comes to the interview level, so before you even start a company. Another tip would probably be to try to find other women or other people who are might be subjected to discrimination for example and and to find each other to to connect with each other and to make sure to to lift and help each other as well but also of course find those specific men in the group who who might have informal or formal power and and who are also uh, smart enough to 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 see these structures as well and try to bring them along with you because that will help you uh, if it's hard for you to to make your voices heard then this person with this informal or formal power will most certainly have an easier time uh, getting themselves heard uh, and then i would also say another tip i would say is to for everyone as well uh, but maybe uh, more more uh, junior professionals uh, um, is to to try to say yes sometimes, even though your instinctive feeling much might be uh, um, ter terrifying. Uh, so if someone asks you to be part of something, for example, uh, a board of director, or workforce, or whatever, and your instinctive feeling is that it is impossible for you to do, then my tip would be to sometimes just really say yes. Uh, and see what happens and and when I say that I often I often I want to, to share a little story from my life because I, I have actually practiced this myself it's not just something I say um, from the first time that I was ever contacted by by TV Swedish uh, news channel TV4 to be part uh, of their uh, morning show as a gender expert and I had never been on TV so my initial response was of course that I became terrified and I thought that wow I'm never going to be able to do this but I didn't say that on the phone I said well of course I would love to come <laughs> uh, and 
And then I went home and I dwelled about it all night. But when the, when the taxi came in the morning, I didn't really have that much choice. I just got in the taxi really. And I drove to the studio and I went on air and it was not the best thing I've ever done. Um, but I did survive. And the next time TV called me, it was not a big issue for me, for me to go on air again. So that is an, another tip I would give really to, to try sometimes to say yes, even though you might not see anyone who, who resembles you in the group or, uh, or even though it might sound terrifying, uh, try sometimes because I think a lot of dudes or people who, who are part of the norm group does that a lot. So I think we can try sometimes too. I think it's good advice because you get out of your comfort zone and your tip to try to push into a, an awkward position and see how you swim. And, exactly. and, 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 and also when you, when you do get that, Jens said, when you do get that question, you can ask, answer yes then, and then you got, you got, still got that half a day or those hours of the week to ask friends, colleagues, how do I address this? Because there's always a lot of people out there to help. So say yes now, and then find somebody in your network who can then help you with, with that being on TV or being that project in question. Uh, we have a thank you very much for for it's it's a really good fireside chat. We got uh, uh, three four questions and a, and a shout out uh, a shout out from Annika who says Tuve love your latest report about mm. badminton. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we will also thank after you. this we will also in the follow up email to this link to that report so you can. I know you also have an English version coming out. Yes, it's out already, so it's okay. on the website. 